Um, I'll, I'll, Olaf, you can maybe people can put some of that into the chat. I could, uh, I could, um, you could read it to me, and then I'll give me an idea of that. That'd be great. I will monitor the chat, so okay. um, you can keep submitting questions to, to the chat, or you can raise your hand. Uh, we can unmute you so you can um, ask your questions directly. Um, and so we are doing this as a um, as a meeting, not a webinar, to have it more interactive. Um, so feel free to participate uh, as much as you would like to. Um, and so just also to give you um, a heads up, we are recording this meeting. Um, and after this session, we will post the video to our YouTube channel. So thank you. And I'm seeing a few come in now. I, I did pull up the chat. I was able to do it. And so I see we've got some PhDs, some MBAs, some people learning, just want to learn about biz dev, their staff. So great. That's great. And, and you keep you keep putting those in. That's really helpful to me because I think if I know some of that, it makes this interactive workshop much more, much more beneficial to you. Um, and that's the point here. The point is that I want to see who's who what use examples that are relevant to you so the title of my talk is business development 101 um, i've done this before with Marilyn, and, and typically this is focused on entrepreneurs and 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 you know faculty types that are starting businesses um you know and so it's not necessarily just for that but we tend to focus on it for the creative types that maybe aren't as well versed in sales. It's not your primary thing. It's not your natural personality, but there's definitely things you can learn and implement to improve your own skill set. I know that for me, I'm good at certain things and I'm not so good at certain things. And I'm always, I will definitely always try to improve the things that I'm not good at just so I can at least have a basic, you know, ability to do certain things. One of those is accounting, for example. I don't like accounting that much, but I know enough that I should be able to read a balance sheet and understand how my business is going. Super important. So in the same vein, so is just being able to do some basic business development, especially if you've got your own business or own effort going on. And because we're in the COVID era here, whoops, here, let me, uh, there we go. because we're in the COVID area, I call this the COVID edition, just, you know, just because of, it's a little different. So as I go through today's talk, I will definitely talk a little bit about the differences between, you know, normal life and sort of, you know, pandemic, worldwide pandemic life, and, but how you can still be effective as a salesperson, as a business development, as an entrepreneur, and, um, and, and in whatever you're doing, even if you're doing research at the present time and you're, and you're trying to figure out how you bridge that gap between, you know, I'm doing research and I want to turn it into a business. How do you do that? How do you go talk to people and how do you use LinkedIn? I'm going to talk about that as well, because I think LinkedIn is one of the best tools um, that you could possibly use. I use it every single day um, <clears throat> for connecting with people. All right. So again, my name is Pramod. Uh, I am a lot of things. Uh, I'll start with serial entrepreneur. I currently run Air Agility, which I'll tell you about in a second. Um, I'm also a, a, a professional pilot. I kind of grew up as a science kid, um, you know, just loved science and engineering and kind of transitioned into the business sales marketing aspect of things. And that's where I've lived for the last 20 or 25 years kind of doing more entrepreneurship type activities, kind of my focus. Um, uh, I do have a bit of a sales background in this, in this, in these endeavors and in the various places I've been, I've always been number one in, uh, in sales. And I just say, I don't, that's not that important. I say that only just so you know that I've been playing this game for a while and maybe there's a few important things that I could share and, 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 um, you know, help you as well. So, um, as Ala mentioned, I run Air Agility, which is here based out of where a UM Ventures spin out. But I'm a proud Terp uh, alumni. Myself and my wife, you can see in the picture there, uh, met at Maryland. We've been married 25 years. Uh, we have a brick. We have our names in a few places on campus. And so that's a lot of fun to be really be back at, you know, on camp, sort of on campus and be part of this ecosystem again having grown up on it, really. I grew up, I was, I went to Maryland before I was in college. I was taking classes, engineering classes while I was in high school, because I went to high school right down the street. And so it was pretty easy to get over here. And then when I came to Maryland campus, it was a natural fit. And now coming back many years later, it's a natural fit as well. And, and proud to be a Terp. And so Air Agility, we are a three and a half year old company. Um, our mission is really simple. We want to improve and save lives. And we do that through AI, artificial intelligence, and autonomy with unmanned systems. 
and I won't talk all about my company here. We can certainly talk about it in Q and A or offline, but I just, that's just who I am right now. So I am very much a startup entrepreneur, which means that you really have to be good at business development and sales to get something, or you have to have somebody that you work with on your team. In, in my case, uh, I met my co-founder who was faculty at the time, and we were introduced by UM Ventures and the entrepreneurs and residents, and we decided to start a company. And I'm more the business guy, and he's much more the technical CTO type. And so we make a really good, uh, I'd say, uh, complementary team that is able to execute. And that's really important. So if you're a potential entrepreneur here or an entrepreneur and you're listening to this, um, that's very important to have the right team members and that can complement what you're good at. All right. Oops, whoops, hang on. There we go. So today's agenda, I'm going to um, focus on defining really quickly. I'll define biz dev because people think it's different things. Um, how do you sort of, you know, work with clients and get these referrals? Uh, we're going to do a small exercise on elevator pitch. Uh, I'll talk about how you track your conversations, things like that. And then maybe some tips, tricks, do's and don'ts. So we'll get a little interactive. I may ask some of you to participate and actually speak, speak and talk. And I, hopefully you'll, you'll be good. So I don't have to pick on you. Um, and then we'll maybe talk just a few sales specifics. And by that point, we'll get to you know, 30 or 35 minutes in and we'll have a little time for Q&A and, and, and then go from there. Um, one of the things I like to say, and I'm going to give this to you guys, hopefully you guys, if you've never seen this book, please jot it down, um, <clears throat> is that business development in general involves, you know, everybody likes to talk about networking and, and some people say, oh, I don't network, I don't like to network. Um, but it is important, I think, that you, that you really get to know people and get to talk to people that maybe complement what you do, that are in the same field as you, whatever. And a great book that you don't even honestly need to read the book. You can just read the title. And, it, and the title says it all, which is Never Eat Alone, which really means, you know, hey, get out there and get to talking to people. So even if you're a researcher on campus, as an example, um, and you have an idea, go out there and start talking to people and, and understand, you know, what they like about your idea. Would they buy your idea? Would, you know, just, just getting some customer discovery. Today's talk is not necessarily focused on customer discovery. We will touch on it a little bit and how important it is. However, um, the point here is just to get out there and start talking. So this book is, a, is really kind of a timeless classic. It was written many years ago, but I absolutely still lean on it as, as, as the points in the book are, are, you know, really, really well, well laid out in the book. Um, so, you know, I, I've been talking a little bit now about networking and, and, you know, so pre COVID we could, we could meet with people, right. We could go get lunch. We could get, have coffee, um, things like that. Um, that's not necessarily always an option right now. And it hasn't been since what late March or April and hopefully by the spring here, it'll start to become much, a much better option. So what are some ideas for being able to connect? and talk to people. Um, I've got some tips there online on, on the screen, you know, in terms of if you have a company that you're running now, how do you get on Zoom and maybe do something together? Um, you know, for in, in, the, in the case of our company, we do an all hands meeting once a week for about 45 minutes and we all interact on Zoom and we, we do certain things to really get to know each other. Um, a couple examples would be a conversation starter. You know, a conversation starter might be something like, you know, what do you, hey, what are you, what, what are you binging on Netflix right now? And, you know, see what everybody says and you might get some ideas there. Um, we've done Zoom cocktail hour, things like that. Um, and so just, just, some, just some ideas there. But the point being that even with COVID, you should be able to connect and make an effort to connect uh, in person, just as we're doing here today. Uh, that, that Allah is doing such a great job of putting these workshops together. It's a great opportunity to meet people. It's a great opportunity. So speaking of that, Allah, now is your cue. If you don't mind um, sharing, you can put the link into the chat session. I've created a little link there that is essentially um, just a Google sheet. And if you're so inclined, put your name there. Um, and there's a few other fields like your LinkedIn and um, uh what else uh, is in there? You know, just your phone number, or email address, that sort of thing that where you can sort of say, hey, I'm willing to connect with the people on this call. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and create a LinkedIn group. And so this is an example of using LinkedIn where I'll take your email, I will find you on LinkedIn, connect with you and create a little group and say, hey, thank you for thank you for joining the talk today. 
you know, uh, and then we can have a conversation there as a group and you can ask me questions or I can ask you questions or what have you. And so it's a great way to start connecting with people and it makes it very efficient as well. Um, so thank you all for posting that. I see that there. So all of you grab that link, go ahead and put your information in and then I'll be able to get your information and put it together into a LinkedIn group. And then you can also connect with me there as well. Okay, so what is business development? So a lot of people say, hey, business development is sales. Well, sales is a piece of business development. A lot of people say business development is marketing. Marketing is a piece of business development. But what if you don't have anything? What if you're not selling anything? I saw in the chat, some of you were researchers or finishing PhDs and were looking to maybe start something. And how do you, you know, how do you actually, then what does business development mean to you? In your case, it might just be, hey, uh, I've got something here and I need to solve the puzzle of what this could be as a product or strategically, you know, who might be a customer of mine? Um, those are the kind of questions you should be asking. Like, who is that customer? You know, what size of business or is it government? Is it, is it commercial industry? Are they going to buy from me? And eventually you get to the point where maybe you have something that you think is worth selling. Then you get even more targeted and you say, hey, well, what industry specifically and which department of that company? And by the way, who's the buyer? Who's the person that's going to actually sign the check? Or is there going to be a user that's really influential that says, hey, I want to use this, but then somebody else is the buyer. And there's some wonderful programs out there. Out there. Some of you that are researcher, researchers on, on this call here have probably heard of i for example. That's a great one. I, I'm a graduate of i -Corps, And um, I went through it through the National Science Foundation. And I've been through some other you know, kind of courses like that. And, um, and they're absolutely wonderful for teaching all of us how to really figure out who we should be selling to, or maybe it changes our product. You know, if we learn that, Hey, maybe the, what we got exactly is not what somebody wants, but they want, they want B not a, and we can maybe figure out how to get from a to B. Um, so just some stuff I have on the screen here are, are some, you know, things that these are, these are kind of the bullet points that would go under business development, essentially. And so it's a very broad term, um, but at the, very, at the most basic level, it's really about figuring out, um, you know, who you should be talking to, what your product is, and, and where should it be presented? Is it at a conference? Things like that. So it's a lot of that. And it, so it's a little bit nebulous, I will admit, but I think you guys get the point that it's, it's, a, it's all of these things. And you, depending on where you are in your life cycle, if you just have a business idea, it's one thing. If you actually have business and, and, and a product to sell or a service to sell, it's another thing. And it can be all these things actually at, at the same time. So that's, that's what I want to convey to you, that it's not any one thing. It's all these things that are under this bucket. Bit nebulous, but also... Um, dependent on what, where you are in the life cycle. So be speaking of life cycle, a uh, little story about me 20 years ago or so, I was buying a franchise and I was growing and I bought it and grew it. And, and it was in the B2B world, software and services. Uh, it was a great experience. But I'll tell you what, when I started that business, I did not think of myself as a salesperson at all. I thought of myself as kind of an engineer type that, you know, was starting a business and I was going to have to figure out this sales piece and hire people that were sales. What I found out, and this book is another great book for some of you that are maybe more on the engineering or science side that are, would love to find out, you know, how do you sort of sell? This is a great book because it sort of talks about, um, you know, somebody that's not necessarily, you know, intentionally going into sales, but how they need to know what they need to know to actually do, do some sales for themselves. Because if you're an entrepreneur, and, th and that's where I'm kind of focused today is more on the entrepreneurial side of things, you do, need to, you do need to be able to have a very basic ability to do some things, such as give an elevator pitch, tell somebody what your business is in about 30 seconds or a minute, maybe more, or, or, or no more than two minutes at, at the very, very, very highest top uh, more, more, more science, most science and engineering types, including myself, like to talk and we'd like to explain our technology and explain what we do. But really, you'll lose your audience if you talk too much. It's, it's, it's just a very basic rule of uh, human nature. Um, and so in the world of if you are an entrepreneur and you're trying to raise money, as an example, and you go and you get in front of a number of investors, uh, what you're going to find is that if you don't get to the point within the first minute of what problem you're solving for them, for the world, or for the specific audience, that they're going to start tapping away on their phones, and they're going to start looking away, and you're going to lose them. And that can apply to any, almost any situation in life. 
So that's that's the point here is that you do have to have some ability to like know what you're doing and how to say it and how to convey it. So the communication and the conveyance becomes very important. This book is a great one that helped me figure that out. Um, and speaking of sales, um, let's say you have an idea and you know what, I'm gonna open it up right now um, and, and you could use the chat session or you can actually speak up. I wanna know, I'd love to know uh, who in the audience and, and don't be shy. Um, do you have a business? Are you selling something right now? Are you thinking about selling something? Are you thinking about creating a product or service? Um, so I'm going to open it up. Anybody feel free to speak up. Don't be shy. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Matthew. I'm a PhD at, a, at also at UMCP. Um, I do AI research with uh, a new, new kinds of neural networks. Um, that are on that, that are sort of cutting edge and, and train differently from current backprop networks. So I'm hoping to do a startup in sometime in the near future, whenever future that can create products out of these new neural networks uh, that can analyze uh, different kinds of more like time series data rather than uh, static data that's typical with current networks. That's awesome, Matthew. We should talk because we're doing some deep learning neural network stuff. So we should talk offline. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and then we have another one here, uh, weather product to forecast road ice drivers. Can whoever that is, uh, Meng, Menglin is that? Could you, could you tell us 20, 30 seconds about that verbally uh, as well? Yes, uh, uh, we, uh, I'm a faculty entrepreneur and uh, um, we developed the uh, weather product, the weather app and the mobile app to forecast the road ice stations, uh, stations which uh, are useful for drivers who drive across the uh, state and for the Department of Transportation in state or uh, city who need this information to decide when and where they need to do that uh, de -ice. Well, that's amazing. So have you gotten it to a point where you have been able to figure out who your customer might be? Yes, we funded by uh, NSF. Uh, SDR phase one, we are closing it and we apply for phase two. Uh, for phase two, we have to figure out who are the buyers and what are the uh, needs. Um, we have a pretty much clear idea. Um, we have the uh, sign and testing users from airport and from uh, Montana DOT and uh, Georgia DOT also indicate interest. The thing is, uh, uh, get uh, the uh, first paycheck is a big challenge. That's why you are talk that they would be very helpful for us. Okay, very good. Well, I, I mean, that sounds exciting. Very uh, um, proud of you of figuring out some of the, the buyers there. And, and that's the point here that nothing happens until a sale is made. Tom Watson, senior of IBM said that. And and it's very true that like, if you have some unique technology, some unique service that you do want to early in the life cycle, want to figure out, start to start to think about that and, and start to think about how that, you know, how that's going to impact what you do and how you maybe even change what you do that makes it attractive. Um, and so that's the point here is that, you know, you cannot have a business without some sort of sale being made. You could have the greatest product in the world, but if nobody knows about it or knows how to use it, it's, it's, it's just not going to happen. So that leads me to my next point, which is Sheryl Sandberg of Facebook said this, which is done is better than perfect. Um, and what do I mean by that? So let's say you do have something uh, again, myself being an engineer, uh, scientists and engineers, we like to kind of tinker and make things just perfect before we release it to the world. Uh, another quote from the founder of LinkedIn, Reid Hoffman, co-founder of LinkedIn said, uh, if you've shipped your product, if you're not slightly, at least slightly embarrassed by the product you shipped, then you've shipped too late. And what he means by that is you've got to get your product at a certain point where it's at least a minimal viable, maybe a minimum lovable, like I like to say, product that somebody might want. This icing product, the icing product sounds like that, where it'd be great, you know, I'm sure it'd be great for the, 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 the various entities that put the, that information out there to be able to 
say that so that they know where to go de-ice and where to keep people safe, right? So, so getting that out there is super important, even if it's not perfect. And those users, we like to call them lighthouse customers, the early customers that, that, are, that are willing to try your product at a cheap price, at a free price, that depends. That's a whole nother workshop on how you do that, but um, is, is super important. So, you know, if you wait too long, somebody's going to pass you by as well. And that, and that's part of the, part of the, part of the, uh, the point with this quote here. Um, so now you have something, you have a product. Now, what do you do? Like, what, how do you, you know, how do you get out there? And so now what I'm going to do, I'm going to segue into actually like getting yourself ready to talk to people. I know that Many of my colleagues who are more on the science side aren't necessarily, you know, the kind of people that want to go and talk to lots of people. They're not naturally introverted, but you can definitely kind of foster that within yourself. And you can you start with just your mindset. And part of that is just being passionate about what you're doing. So like today, I'm here to talk to you and, and I'm, I'm passionate about this. I'm passionate about business development. So for me, it's a lot of fun to just talk about this and talk to you about it. Um, but, and then, of course, you know, these other things are sort of some intangibles, you know, just kind of having the right appearance, having the right mindset of let me get out there and talk to people, the right spirit, the enthusiasm. That's, you know, some of that's called the it factor where, you know, it's just people are like, wow, that person is really passionate. That person really loves what they're doing. And that's that's contagious. And people love that as well. Um, but, you know, when it comes to like actual tactical stuff, like there are rules you can follow, like what? What are rules you could follow for business development? And for me, uh, you know, I, I, I'm going to try to use some real life examples right now. So we at Air Agility are talking to many, many different partners for how we launch our product, what we do with our product. And it's not always easy. We're having many, many, many conversations. And, and really the most important thing that I have to do when I'm trying to figure out who I should even talk to is, well, okay, great. We want to do, we want to, we have A and we want B. In the case of, the example that we just heard about the de-icing product, it might be, okay, we have this product, but who really wants it? Who would pay for it? And what is the outcome of that? Like what, what, if we want to have a con, maybe, maybe we don't know who's going to buy it just yet. So we got to figure out who we're going to talk to. What is the outcome of that conversation? The outcome could just be, Hey, they're interested. Let's, let's sign an NDA and keep talking. You know, that could be, it could be that simple. So I do like to, before I go into a conversation, figure out what that outcome is. And then, um, you know, when do I want to do this? If I'm trying to figure out strategy for something, let me put some timing, let me put some goals and, and deadlines in place so that we actually stay on track and we execute. And then where am I going to do this? Um, you know, in terms of like in, in, in the product, we just heard about the, the icing, there's, there's certain probably entities, as, as you were explaining, that, that would have an interest in this. Maybe it's the Northeast type of entities and, and the Northern entities, maybe not so much in the deep South, you know, and so figuring out where you're going to target. And then the biggest, most important thing that I always start with, in fact, I should probably change it and put it on top is what's your why. When I introduced myself and I told you about Air Agility, I said, hey, our mission in life really is to improve and save lives. That's our why. It's why we do what we do. And if you've never heard of Simon Sinek, I encourage you to Google him. The last name is spelled S-I-N-E-K, Simon Sinek. And he has this great talk, it's on YouTube, and it's all about um, why you do what you do. And he talks about how some companies really, really, they lead with that. Apple is one of those. And, and you, he'll, you, I'm not going to go into it right now because it'll take too long. But if you, if you watch this, I think it's about a 14-minute YouTube video, you will see, um, you will get the point about leading with your why. Of, of why you do what you do. And then, you know, and then you can, of course, talk about how you do that, but leading with the why is so powerful. So I will leave you with that from the, uh, from these simple rules uh, in terms of relationships and, 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 and explaining what you do. Um, okay, so now we have another exercise. I'm looking for volunteers. Um, I, I, I always like to, this is a point that's very important when you have a product or you have a service. I see some in the chat, somebody was saying that they were gonna start a service business soon. Um, I want you, and because we're in COVID and most people are socializing outdoors versus indoors, I'm going to ask one of you, and anybody can volunteer, to sell me a fire pit. So I want you, and don't be embarrassed, which this is just going to be totally fun. We're not, I'm not going to pick on you or anything like that. Sell me your fire pit. Like so, so tell me why I should buy a fire pit from you. All right. Do I have any volunteers before I do pick on somebody? <laughs>
Nobody volunteering? How about our gentleman who was talking about the AI algorithms? Would you like to volunteer? <laughs> And also to interject here, we actually have a successful University of Maryland startup called MF Fire, and they sell clean burning wood stoves. Yeah, absolutely. Does it have to be an actual fire pit, like a literal, like wood and the whole thing? No, you can make up whatever you want. I'm not looking to learn about the product. I want to know why I should buy the fire pit. Uh, it could be a smart fire pit. Yes, it could be anything. Uh, okay, so um, let's see. So most people, when they come home, have to put the fire logs in themselves and then light the fire. Um, I'm sure I'll go with the smart fire pit. My smart fire pit actually will detect when you enter the household and ignite uh, a spark and light the fireplace for you as you enter the door. So you now you don't have to uh, start the fire yourself. It will be ready for you when you enter the house. What's your name? Matthew. Oh, Matthew. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Sorry. I, I didn't see, I couldn't see who was speaking. Okay. Perfect. Um, okay. Well, Hey, that's really cool. So what you just explained to me were features, really cool feature. Mm, uh, how about, so this is what, this is where I'm trying to change the mindset for you. Gotcha. Think about an outcome and that's perfect. You played right into it. So, <laughs> so great job, but um, the outcome. So tell me about the out. So, so what I want to focus on are the outcomes. So if I was to do that all over again, I might say, Hey, when you walk into your house, wouldn't you like it to be warm versus cold? Or, you know, if you're sitting on your deck, it's COVID, right? And you're trying to you're trying to socialize. Instead of sitting outside in the cold, wouldn't you like to have some warm heat and some light? Maybe you want to read. I can read by the light. You know, a lamp is probably a better example for that. But mm. what I'm getting at is the outcome. What's the outcome? The outcome is I feel warm when I walk in mm. and I get that, you know, that fire pit automatically fires up that fire, whatever, like you just explained, what is the outcome? So think about what you want people to feel, see, hear, smell, whatever, versus the actual feature. So in the case of a lamp, like what, what I was just sort of alluding to, I might not say, oh, hey, the switch is really easy to use. Um, you could place this lamp anywhere. In fact, you don't have to plug it in. Those are features. What I might say is, hey, the lighting is so warm that when you read, you're not gonna, your eyes are not gonna get tired. That's an outcome, right? You can read longer. Right. So think about, think about, yeah. Or, Hey, somebody put igniting a romantic relationship. Yeah. I like that too. That's an outcome. So think about a commercial you might see when they sort of like play to your emotions. That's what I'm getting at. So when you have some sort of product, so in the case of the neural network there that you were describing the neural, the AI algorithms, it might be that a robot can do a versus B and a is way better than B, right? Because, you know, for example, the, the robot may be able to think on its own and go left versus right because it knows that there's something it needs to go explore and you know on, on path a mm -hmm. and you you the human there's no human in the loop that needs to tell it to do that right so it's doing it automatically so if i'm a business the outcome is an roi for me i'm thinking oh i don't need to necessarily have a person that needs to sit there and monitor that camera because the AI is doing such a good job of it. So I just reduced my head count. I'm not saying we should reduce jobs or anything like that, but if you think about it, that's an ROI, right? Mm -hmm. um, or if, if in our case, we were building a drone that can, I could teach you to fly it in 10 seconds versus many hours of training, which many, dro many drones require. That's an ROI because I might have spent 70% of my budget on training costs. And now as a business, I don't need to spend that much. Maybe I only have to spend 10% on training costs and teach, teach my, uh, my drone pilots about safety, but not necessarily operation. So I'm hoping you get the point there. It's all about outcomes, not features. I just wanted to do a simple exercise. So thank you for playing along and thank you for, you know, thank you for doing that. No problem. All right. Let's see here. Uh, any, well, I will go to questions in a little bit here. I'm going to keep going so that I can get to that point. Um, but so here's another thing. So I'm sort of jumping around a little bit with different subject matter and I'm doing it purposely because I'm just trying to hit home on a few high points. So let's now use the example that that fire pit is something you are selling and or, or that uh, or the MF fire product, which is pretty cool. And I know them really well. Um, you um, you've now got something, but hey, the people that you're talking to, the distributor, the the uh, um, the person that maybe has influence that can help you get it to the right markets or what have you, they're not 
they're not necessarily responding to you. Um, you know, there's this thing called consistent follow-up. And there are some stats that I could share with you, which I'll just verbally share right now, which is that when you're selling something, it can take sometimes seven, eight times for you to get somebody's attention. And I would say in today's economy with COVID and everybody online, it might be more like eight to 12 because there's just so much noise, so many emails, so many things online that, you know, that, that, uh, that, uh, that is just out there. And, and the other point I'll drive home here is that no doesn't mean no. I can't tell you how many relationships we have at Air Agility and in my past businesses where something didn't like quite work out when I wanted to, but by maintaining the relationship, by keeping in touch, by saying, hey, here's our updates on what we're doing, whether it was through a newsletter or just a direct email, that it led to something a year later or two years later. So no doesn't mean no, it means stay familiar, stay relevant, and it could mean a yes later on. Um, when you are talking to people, especially when it comes to your product, you as an inventor or a scientist or an engineer, lo we, we love to talk about our products. And, and the key is, the, the, is really the opposite. You should listen more than you should talk because you want to understand what people are thinking about what you're saying. So at some point you talk, you say it, and you do it in a contrite manner, and then you learn to listen and then ask questions um, as needed at that point. And um, so I love this because this is from the movie Dumb and Dumber, you know, that, you know, in the, in the world of entrepreneurship, which is not easy at all, if you have something cool to share, you're going to get a lot of rejection. But as I mentioned on the previous slide, you know, if, if there's always a chance, so don't, don't ever underestimate, just kind of try to keep pivoting and figuring out how you could get that in front of the right people. And so it's a lot of resilience. Um, and, you know, you're going to have conflict. You're going to have people that are going to say, I don't really like what you're doing or why not buy product, your, this other product and it's better. You know, that's just conflict. That's, that's, that's okay. But don't disappear. Again, stay, stay relevant. Um, and, and, you know, just some, I won't read all this to you, but just essentially, you know, learn to really listen and react in an appropriate way so that you maintain the relationship. That's really the key here. Business development, a lot of it is just about relationships. You're going to get a lot of phone calls. You get a lot of people that want to talk to you. If you can do the things that are on this screen, as far as having trust and respect for each other, determining, even if you get a negative reaction, how do you react? Um, more respect is given to you. And then, you know, maintaining your word. If you say you're going to do something, do it. And also be honest. If you can't do something, you can't do something. And, and that, that will have a lot of respect and people will see that you have integrity. Um, okay, now one more exercise here, um, the elevator pitch. Um, so this is another sort of thing that's very important. If you are thinking about starting a business, have started a business or have an idea, is being able to explain it and the elevator pitch, of course, if you've never heard this term, which probably most of you have, comes from, hey, if you're on an elevator and you just have a few seconds or a minute to tell somebody about what you're doing, you know, what will you do? And there's actually a TV show. I think it's on, hmm, I can't remember the channel. It might be uh, Cheddar, I think, or something like that. Um, it's, it's called Elevator Pitch. And it's literally somebody coming up an elevator. They have 60 seconds to, to say what they're about to do. Or they come up the elevator and they, they get in front of a bunch of judges and they they basically give 60 seconds or two or two minutes to do to say what they uh, have to say and then they get maybe get investment maybe not so these are the key elements right here what your company does what's that unique business proposition like what exactly are you is your value driver and are there some results and things that you could back up you know back up what you're saying and then maybe ask a question um, so I'm going to give you a couple examples. I'm not sure we have time to really, when I do this in person, which is the more preferred way of doing it, we actually sit down in groups and actually do this. But today I'm just going to do it for purposes just to show you. So read that. I'll give you, you know, 10 seconds to read that. Okay. So that's elevator pitch number one. Now... Elevator pitch number two. Read that about 10 seconds. Okay, there's one. There's two. Any okay, anybody can volunteer. Which one is better? Obviously, the answer we know the answer, but tell me why it's better. Second one is better because it has uh, numbers to support uh, uh, what uh, the outcome. 
Ooh, Absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. So in the, in the, in the example I used with, uh, with uh, just giving the drone example, a couple of minutes ago, I talked about the reduction of training costs. That's an, that's an example of a number. So if you can back up your, what you're saying with some sort of hard data that, that, uh, that you could back up if, if you needed to, uh, is very, very, very powerful. And then, you know, sort of, so the example of this, these elevator pitches is to be used in settings where you're just meeting somebody for the first time. And all you're trying to do is pique their interest. You're not trying to talk their ear off and you're not trying to get a meeting right there. You're trying to potentially get a meeting. So the example, an example I'll use is that before COVID, we, you know, the Maryland Alumni Association and UM Ventures and, you know, some of the other uh, organizations at Maryland, we're having some networking events and they would have happy hours and things like that. And if you come up, if you, if you're at the happy hour and you're meeting somebody and you, you, maybe, you know, somebody there, maybe you find, maybe there's somebody there you want to talk to, maybe they're an investor in, from Dingman angels. And you'd love to, you'd love to have a chat with them. Your goal in that, in that, in that scenario is not to talk their ear off at that event. Your goal is to somehow get introduced to them and then be able to do one of these quick 30 second to one minute pitches and, and then, and then the engaging question might not necessarily be about your product. It could be, hey, I would love to learn how or if you or Dingman Angels invests in a company like mine. And they might say, yeah, great. You know, here's my card. Give me a call. We'll schedule something. And that's what you want. You want, you want to be able to now have a good 30 to 40 minutes on a phone call, a Zoom call, a coffee, whatever, to really be able to get a little more detailed about what you do and really pique their interest. So the elevator pitch is designed for you to just hey, let me just get somebody's attention. And, and then there's a good way to do that and a bad way to do that. And you saw both just now. So very quick uh, sort of introduction to the elevator pitch. Now, if you are starting a product, you are maybe, um, you have an idea um, or maybe you have something you're already selling, um, you need to track it. Just like you would track scientific data or engineering data, you need to track the relationship management. So the term is called customer relationship management. Salesforce is probably the, the, the name that everybody knows. That's the, probably the behemoth, the 800 pound gorilla out there in, the, in this world. And you can see them on the screen here. I have them listed. And there's a number of other products. Some are free, some are paid. Um, you could do it on the spreadsheet as well, as you see there, Excel. And um, the point being, an example would be something like this, is that if you are truly doing sales, you, you build a little pipeline. If you're just monitoring conversations, you could do that here too. You could say, hey, I'm just going to I'm just going to start talking to potential buyers, prospects. I don't exactly know who they are yet. I don't even know who to target yet, but I'm going to start tracking my conversations. And then the ones that actually make sense will kind of further them and, in, in, you know, further them down the line. And what I have on the screen is actually a sales pipeline. So if you are selling something, then, you know, maybe you've met somebody in the new category. Um, you've had a meeting. So there was some information gathering. Maybe you signed an NDA. And then they said, hey, we're really interested in what you're doing. Love to learn about the details, the cost, the timeline, et cetera. That could be a proposal. And then there's follow-up and hopefully closing in a positive way. And if, if, if it's even if it's not a positive thing, you can at least do some learning from it and understand why they didn't buy your product or did they buy a competitor that were they just not interested right now? Um, was it the timing just bad? And they're going to be interested in six months. Great. Let me put you back into my CRM and reach out to you in six months. And then here's an important point. If you even if you are selling or talking to people about your product or service and they just say, no, I'm not really interested. You can still get permission from them to say, hey, is it okay if I send you an update every now and then in my newsletter or marketing? Um, and most people will say yes. And if they do, then great. You add them to your list and you can just keep them in the loop. And who knows what will happen down the road? And, you know, again, depending on if they're, rel you know, if they're relevant to you or not. So as I kind of cl get closer to closing here, some do's and don'ts as you reach out to people. It says prospect here, which means sales, but it, it could be just customer discovery too. It could just mean somebody you're talking to that you want to learn, that, that you want to tell them about your concept that you have, your idea. Um, the same principles apply, you know, be responsive, follow up, you know, don't overpromise and underdeliver things like that. So I'm not going to read all these to you and I'm, I will happily provide this deck. And I think Allah has it. And if not, I'll forward it to her to, to provide to you. Um, you can reach out to me as well. Um, and so 
a lot of little tips here, which you can read in your, you know, offline, but I highlighted a couple that I think uh, really stand out, especially the first one, especially if you are, you know, just trying to talk to people. Um, and as a company right now, we talk to people that are, that have ideas all the time and we want to hear their ideas and then see if there's maybe a fit with something we're doing from a business perspective or not. Um, so as we close here, um, here's a big home, big point I want to drive home. People care about their problems. They care about what keeps them awake at night and what can solve their pain. So it's all about the pro solution to their problems. Um, they don't necessarily care about you or me, even if we're really good at sales or really good at talking to people, they really care about their problem. That being said, if they like you, they're going to call you. So, you know, it's, it's not bad to be likable. <laughs> so, uh, definitely, you know, that does play a factor in whether they call you or not. Um, and then here's another, the other point that I've highlighted is if you are a business owner right now, or you're thinking about starting a business or you're faculty and you have an idea, remember that there's strength in numbers. So what I mean by that is you can't do it all yourself. You could be the best professor and researcher in the world. You could have the best ideas in the world. But if, if while you're working on technology, if somebody else is not working on business development, that means something's not happening. So it's important to be able to do both in parallel, which means it typically means you're going to want to partner with somebody or some or a group of people if, 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 if you need more than two. Two to three seems to be the perfect number for most businesses as, as far as a founding team, but it could be four or five too. There's many successful businesses that have that. Um, so, but the point I want to drive home is that it, while you're focused on the technology or the underlying enabling science, somebody needs to be doing the business development and it's near impossible for the that one person to do it all. Uh oh, hang on one second. Ah, here we go. Um, we're not going to go into that like, other than there's this, this term called ABC, always be closing. There's a great sales video. I'm not going to show it right now, lack of time, but this is a rule that I follow our, and even our, even our individuals in our company that, that are not in sales follow, which is really always be talking about your product, which means you're always sort of closing, always kind of gauging interest, always asking questions and, and seeing where the interest lies. There's a lot of local resources. If you are interested in just learning more about, you know, sales, business development, there's the Institute for Excellence in Sales, which is based in Tyson's Corner, Virginia. Uh, Sandler is a great training organization that's all over the country. And then there's many events. Unfortunately, most of them are virtual now. One of them is the Big Idea Connectpreneur, which a lot of Maryland uh, organizations and Smith School and Dingman take part in as well. And um, let's see, in COVID, you know, I, I didn't really get into uh, who has businesses here, but I'm sure that many are struggling. There's a few great examples of companies that really pivoted to survive and are now thriving um, during these last eight, nine months. There's a couple, they're both on, they're on the right side of the screen. One of them is a local company called Try Hungry um, and they pivoted into more of a, a consumer model versus a B2B model and they, they've really done well. Um, again, my name is Promoter Mode for short. Uh, I'd love to, we have a little bit of time for q and I'd love to get in the Q&A and, and just have a discussion with anybody who would like to talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Promo. This has been uh, very helpful. Um, and so this is a, uh, since this is a meeting, you can um, unmute yourself, turn your camera on and ask a question. Or you, if you uh, prefer, you can also submit it on chat and I will read it to Promo. I know somebody said they have a lot of noise in their house. So feel free to submit it on the chat. Hi, this is Giovanni. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. thank you. Hi. Hi, Pramod. Thank you very much for the very interesting uh, talk. I have a question about uh, those uh, CRM systems you showed before, um, like in the example, if that was Salesforce or something similar. When uh, in the development of a startup, you should start using those, those type of software and uh, be more systematic about uh, the, the discussion you have with the prospective customers. Thank you. Yeah, great question. And um, so the short answer is as soon as possible, but you don't need to pay for something right away. There's plenty of free product out there, you know, that you can use right from the get-go. At the very, very, very least, I would start with Excel spreadsheet. And, and I do have a template I'm happy to share with you that, you know, is a good starting point. 
Um, that being said, there are a lot of uh, more software automation driven programs that have you know free versions, especially when you're starting out. Um, but what I would do is is and is is really sorry, track I'm those just, things. I'm sorry, are, there is some background noise, like I couldn't uh, catch a part of the answer. The map, how to get there? It's on the web page on our. On oh, somebody needs to mute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, the second and I'm ah, trying to figure go. out who okay. I think they I think they figured it out. Yeah, so, okay. so Giovanni, it's it's I'd say I don't know if you heard me, but uh, as early as you possibly can, but you don't need to pay for something right away. You could do something free or you could just use Excel. And I'm happy to provide a template that I'll give to Allah that she can send out to the to the participants. Um, but and you could just do it in Google Sheets if you like, but I'd say the earlier you track things, the better. It also shows if you are going out for investment and I'm making an assumption here, I don't know if you are or not, but if you're looking for investors at some point, um, if you can show them that, if you say, look, um, we have been, along with developing our product or our service, we are also doing customer discovery and talking to potential prospects and partners along at the same time. And you can show them that list. That's powerful because then they believe you're actually doing something versus, okay, you have a product, but we don't really know if somebody, if people are interested in it, you can show them that and say, look, we've been talking to so many people here and they've told us these, but at the very least it shows that you are active. I hope I answer your question, but as soon as possible, but you don't need to pay any expensive money for it early on at all. Yes, I do pay for a subscription to something like five, $600 a year. You don't need to do that early on. Thank you. If we can have the template, that would be great. Actually, sure. thank you. Other questions, comments, discussion. Um, hi again. Thank you so much for organizing or coming to talk with us today. This uh, sort of interactive session has been one of the one of the greatest uh, talks that have, that I've seen here. So thank you so much for that. Great to hear. Um, uh, I ask this to every sort of to everyone that gives a talk just to sort of like do a weighted sum of, of advice. But what, what advice would you give for someone in, in, in sort of a PhD position that's that wants to do a startup, doesn't have a company yet, but has ideas brewing and isn't, you know, I'm sort of, I just have a few years left. So I was, you know, I, I, I when, when, when to actually start the business, when to uh, begin all of these steps of, you know, customer discovery or things like that. If you have any general advice for that, that'd be great. Yeah, that, and that, that's a great question. It's a broad question, so I'll give you <laughs> I'll give you a full bullet point. Yeah, least. sorry about that. <laughs> that's okay, because um, you know I don't know everything about you. I don't know how far you're on your PhD, all those kind of things. Uh, you know, it's it's so it's it's kind of one of those things that the more I know, the more I, the more targeted advice. But in general, I would say that if you have something that you think is you know meaningful, and I think you're the one with the AI and the learning, the neural networks and neural out you know neural algorithm AI algorithms. There's probably something there. I you know that that market is hot, and there's, you know, again, not knowing enough, learning where you what you're doing, what industries they could be impactful in would be would be a good thing to start. Like where where would where would this work? And you know, many people when they have an idea will say, hey, well, I could use this idea in all kinds of industries. Well, that's true, but it's probably true. But you got to start somewhere. So you may want to figure out by doing some research, what are their competitors to what you're doing. And this is just Google research, essentially. Um, if you do have something and you're starting to take it forward, let's assume um, NSF or i is, and, and Allah probably you knows how to get you in touch with all the i people. That's a great place to start, you know, kind of learning. In fact, my partner, before I met him, was engaging in some of the i activity with his idea. And then I eventually met him and we became business partners. And he was faculty at at Maryland as well. And so that was, that was something that, you know, he started to engage on. And then I think if you are doing a PhD and you want to start a business, it's probably difficult to, you know, try to do both at the same time by yourself. So then you may want to think about, well, you know, do I want to have a partner? Do I, should I bring somebody in? Um, again, you know, UM Ventures uh, and Allah are great at that. They're great at uh, saying, you know, Hey, um, Let's 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 introduce you to you know Joe or Jim or whoever, and and these this person might be good. Um, I'm speaking to another faculty uh, um, person right now, and he's got an entrepreneur in residence that's sort of helping him figure out how to commercialize what he's doing, and and 
that was pure business development. That was an introduction from Allah. Then I met that person and that person started talking to me and said, hey, I have this faculty who's got an idea. And we said, hey, let's take a look at it. And now we have actually already, Allah, by the way, have had like three or four meetings and are kind of figuring out, yeah, how to, how to maybe do something there. And so it's very, it's very impactful. And um, so, so Matthew, I don't know if I completely answered your question. Uh, I would say start with research, start with you know, really understanding the industries that you're interested in and see and maybe validate to some extent, are, are you are you thinking along the right lines, right? And and then, and of course the holidays are a great time to do that, right? If you had, because there's a little more, I know you're busy with your PhD, but there's probably a little more time on your hands, at least during the couple of weeks of holidays, I hope. And you could probably just at least get yourself pointed in a direction um, that, that sort of says, hey, this is an industry that would be a great starting point. And, you know, your initial set of assumptions might be right, might be wrong. And that's where I would say start validating um, and start thinking about it. And then, you know, some of the best business ideas have come out of master's and PhDs programs. So, you know, you might have something there that, that you could launch sooner rather than later. And then you want to think about how you do that. Do you need a partner and that's kind of working full time while you're also still going to school? Just some ideas. Thank you. Yeah, given the very broad question I asked, uh, I appreciate you actually gave me <laughs> some, you actually gave me some tangible direction. So th thank you very much. Absolutely. Um, and I just posted uh, information on the next i info session. Um, and actually, David Steele, who is a program manager for i is on this, um, is on this uh, workshop. So he can answer some questions as well. Uh, but I posted a link. Uh, join the link and you can read more and sign up for the next info session about it. That's a great program. I would recommend. Uh, and Matthew, I recommend that you take that as the first step. Uh, any other questions? Uh, I have a quick question. Uh, where I can find a uh, um, high quality uh, sales force? You give some links, but uh, you did not get a chance to, uh, to tell us how to identify these people. Are you saying, I just wanna make sure I understand the question, how to find salespeople, is that what you asked? Yes, please. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very good. Yeah, so recruiting in any endeavor, of, of course, is a, is a, is a, is an interesting thing, and we like to call them fishing holes, right? Where where do we get, where do we find people? Where where are our fishing holes? Um, I would say, um, you know, there, again, a very broad, you know, broad sort of a broad answer there. Um, some of it is just, you know, through networking. You could, of course, talk to recruiters. Um, LinkedIn, talk to your network, see if they know people. Um, and I'd say also, depending on the stage of your business, you know, you, you don't necessarily need a salesperson too early on, right? You, it's a, a, many times the founders are just fine for trying to get out there and get, get, their, get their early product in the hands of users. Once you have a repeatable, scalable product, which maybe you do have, then absolutely you should think about how, how do I really now distribute and scale this? And one of those could be a direct sales force as you're asking. Um, but to answer your question directly about where do you find salespeople, they are super hard to find, I will tell you that. Um, and and you know, finding them is, 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 is almost like an art in, in, its, in itself. Um, but LinkedIn is a great place to start. LinkedIn research um, is a great place to really just figure out, you know, people that maybe are in the industry or have some sort of technology background that you're looking for that have been successful in sales. And again, depending on what type of salesperson you're looking for, are they going to be super experienced, like a VP of sales, or are they going to be general, you know, account managers and, and, and that sort of thing. There's salespeople don't come in, they come in all shapes and sizes and all different roles as well. So it really depends on that. But I'd say LinkedIn is, is one of the most powerful tools I've ever seen that, that really helps you find people. And you can do it through your network too. You can just kind of reach into your network um, and say, hey, uh, I am looking for this type of salesperson. Here's the description, please help me. That's a great starting point. Thank you. Are there any other tools that you found useful, especially now that everybody um, is, um, you know, is working remotely, you know, obviously other than Zoom, Google Groups, um, Slack, any other, six, any other useful tools that you found that are useful? Yeah, I mean, there, there's so many tools out there from a, 
from a collaboration standpoint with within the members of our company, we use a great project management uh, tool. It's unfortunately not super cheap. It's called monday.com. Um, but we find it a great way to track our roadmaps of our you know software, hardware, and also different projects that are going on. And also it, it works and integrates well with Slack and other tools. We find that to be you know a very powerful tool. Um, and on the on the networking um, sort of sales outreach side, of course, I've said, you know probably mentioned it a few times now. LinkedIn, of course, is is super powerful. Um, but even even social media ha for us has been uh, a powerful tool. You know, just kind of to answer your question around tools, um, being engaged on social media. And when I say engaged, I don't mean just posting things. I mean actually, if somebody likes what you're doing, engaging with them or engaging with people that are complementary to you or in your industry that you can also say something to them. And so I think having an engagement arm of what you're doing and that, and that does take, you know, some sort of uh, time and effort, of course. Um, we, uh, and by the way, whoever asked the question, I think it was Jin Wung about the sales, um, you know, we utilize interns quite a bit too. We hire a lot of interns to do pieces of all of this. Um, I have one intern, for example, from the Smith School who helps us with PR outreach and um, and sales research, kind of like what you were asking uh, a little bit, you know. And then we've got another intern that helps that, that, that sort of executes on the social media. So if you're in an early stage company like we are, um, there are many, many University of Maryland, College Park, University of Baltimore, whatever interns that like people that want to would love to intern um, and get some valuable experience. And it can really help your company without you trying to break the bank, trying to hire full time right away. Even if you have funding, you know, it's an, it's a great way to start with something and then you can gra graduate it into a full-time position at some point. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we are at time. Um, I'm sure promote you're very busy, probably have other places to run uh, <laughs> on a jump on another zoom meeting. That's what we're probably. Do these days. Yeah. By 5 PM, I have zoom fatigue every day. <laughs> oh yes. Well, thank you so much. Um, and as I mentioned, this session has been recorded. We will post it on YouTube um, and I will share the slides with everybody as well. Uh, and if you have any additional questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to me or to promote. Um, and uh, please do uh, register for the upcoming i session uh, or reach out to David, David Steele uh, for additional information. I posted a link um, as well and hope to see everybody for our next workshop next week. Yeah, and thank you so much, Ala. Thank you, everybody, for being here. And I will, after I see the uh, spreadsheet, I'll go ahead and create a, a quick LinkedIn group and, and, and uh, link in with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. And I do have to say, I really love this more interactive format as well. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yep. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks Bye -bye. to everybody. Bye-bye.